Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Alyssa Sinaway. I'm an architectural specialist here at ArtX. Um, in an effort to stay connected during this time of social distancing, we will host webinars every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Today is a very special edition of this weekly webinar series. We are welcoming a special guest speaker, Mr. Oh. David Stevenson. David is the president of the RPM Group, which is the largest decorative contracting uh, decorative concrete contracting company in the United States. I would personally like to thank David for sharing his time and knowledge with all of us today. Please note that unfortunately, today's presentation does not count for AIA credits. However, this is an amazing opportunity to hear from one of the top experts in this field. We will resume our AIA accredited webinar content next week, covering adhesives and navigating high RH. And with that, I am honored to turn it over to David. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. I wish I could see all of you. Um, <clears throat> so I've been teaching uh, classes for a long time. I took uh, one of my um, PDFs and converted it for this class for you guys. So I want to go through that. Um, please feel free as we go along to type questions. So this is going to uh, read them to us uh, after my presentation. So feel free to ask anything that pops into your mind, and I will do my absolute best to answer it. So away we go. Uh, this class is uh, titled An Architect's Guide to Polish Concrete. I always start out by uh, talking about who I am and why do I feel like I can teach classes like this. So um, as Alyssa said, my name is David Stevenson. I'm uh, president of the RPM Group. We are uh, the largest concrete contracting company in the U.S. We have offices coast to coast and do um, uh, polished concrete mainly, but we do all kinds of um, resinous floors and floor prep and a whole slew of other random uh, decorative concrete things. I've been in this industry for about 20 years. I was one of the first guys to do polished concrete work in the country. Um, I had a, a contracting company that uh, started out doing acid stains and overlays, and I bought uh, some of the first polishers to ever come into the United States and uh, started teaching myself how to polish concrete. In the beginning, <clears throat> in the beginning, polished concrete was mainly industrial and uh, plain gray industrial floors. Um, I kind of was in the right place at the right time, and um, we, myself and some partners, we invented concrete dye uh, at a manufacturing company uh, called Ameripolish that uh, brought color to the industry. We kind of changed the changed the industry from an industrial uh, industrial flooring type to an architectural flooring type, and uh, just continue to grow from there. I've uh, you got a bunch of patents and work with a bunch of manufacturers like Artex um, to help the industry. So I took over as president of RPM Group um, about three years ago, and uh, it just continued to kind of grow. So that's why um, I feel I can teach you guys. So um, I start this by asking, you know, everybody wants to know what is polished concrete. Polished concrete is pretty simple. It's a mechanically polished process that's extremely durable. As I stated, uh, polished concrete was invented or created as an industrial floor with um, for heavy, heavy traffic forklifts and moving around of heavy equipment and, and goods. As the process has developed, we learned how to get the floors to be highly reflective. Everybody likes uh, shiny floors now. Um, so it's a mechanically polished, durable, highly reflective floor. It does shine without wax. Thought I'd take a second and tell you guys how that happens. So this is a ref example of what a, a power trial finish looks like under a microscope. I could show you the actual microscope, but it, it's very busy. 
So when light uh, reflects onto the floor, it hits the ridges and reflects down in the valleys, making the floor look dull to our eyes. With polished concrete, we come through and cut off the peaks, for lack of a better term, and leave a lot of uh, almost like a plateau, which allows those uh, light beams to reflect up. The finer you work the slab, the higher the reflection gets. So want to go through how is it done? <clears throat> Polished concrete uses heavy duty equipment, very heavy equipment uh, to mechanically hone the slab. Typically you use diamond tools. There's two types mainly. There's um, metal bond tooling. Metal bond tooling like you see in the photo here uh, does the stock removal or the grinding half of a polished concrete finish. So this is the bottom um, three or four steps typically. It's done using metal. Metal holds larger diamond, uh, industrial grade diamond pieces. So a lot like sandpaper, the lower the number, so if you hear a 25 grit or a 40 grit, a lot like sandpaper, those are larger chunks of diamond. Metal does a really good job of holding those in suspension so that the diamonds can actually cut the concrete. And about halfway through the process, you switch from the stock removal grinding half to the polishing half. And also a lot like sandpaper, you try to work up progressively step by step. So if you, a typical new construction polished concrete slab might start with an 80 grit, work its way 80 grit, 150 grit um, in the metals, and then transition over to the resin tools, which is the photo that you see on the bottom. Uh, resin tools are great for holding smaller diamond dust and particulates. So we'll typically go 100 resin, 200 resin, 400 resin, 800 resin, and if you want a high gloss finish, a 1500 resin. Uh, and so we do that by putting them in a um, um, resin matrix that wears away faster, allowing those small diamond dust and diamond particulate to remove scratches. So the goal is removing scratches from the step before. If you don't remove the scratches, which for those of you who might want to hang out after the presentation, I can show you some photos of floors that have scratches left. Uh, scratches will lower the shine. Um, they'll also affect the longevity of the floor and the maintenance. Every polished concrete floor also uses chemical treatments to assist uh, the floor. First, we use densifier. Densifier has a chemical reaction with the cement material, grows little crystals in the slab. It closes up a lot of the pore structure and makes the surface very dense. So it's called densifier or hardener. Um, depending on your use, depending on the, the building use, there's different types of stain protects. Uh, that you can use. You would use a different type of stain protection from a grocery store to, say, a school. Um, but stain protects, polished concrete is breathable, so uh, you want something there to slow down penetration of liquids, which allows um, for plenty of time for, um, for spills and things to be cleaned up. <clears throat> One of the things that, uh, for those of you not in the industry, that is a lot of times a little bit confusing is the equipment. So I want to take a minute and show you kind of what to expect there. Polished concrete equipment examples. Here's three different manufacturers. Um, one thing you'll uh, notice about all of these, they all have uh, shrouds. They all have shrouds over the bottom that stops uh, the dust or concrete particulate from getting loose into the building. Um, most of them have water tanks so that you can run them uh, wet if need be. There are some machines that are propane powered and some machines that are electric powered. Depending on your use and the facility, uh, you may use one or the other or both. Recently, uh, say in the last few years, you started to see a lot of um, polished concrete 
manufacturers making tooling for odd machinery types. So on the right here is a um, is a standard auto scrubber, and on the left is a swing buffer. When I first started in the industry, there was maybe three or four diamond manufacturers, tooling manufacturers that would make um, equipment for polished concrete. Last year, World of Concrete, there was about 400 or so, and uh, it seems like everybody and their and their grandmother is getting into the industry. A lot of those guys find that it's hard to compete against the more traditional manufacturers, so they'll um, make uh, tooling and uh, devices for odd other equipment. The difference, oops, I'm sorry. The, the difference between this piece of equipment and the ones that I showed you on the next slide, these grinders typically cost about $60,000 a piece, $70,000 a piece. That's not including the vacuums, the separators, the cords, the hoses, uh, the plates, or any of the tooling. Um, as this industry has grown, and we'll get into some traps here in a few minutes, but as the industry has grown, a lot of people have start saying they use polished concrete or that they can install polished concrete. They'll use improper equipment like this shown and uh, give you kind of a false polished slab. So if you see guys trying to polish concrete with this type of equipment, uh, you know that you're, you kind of got a problem. <clears throat> so polished concrete is growing very fast. Um, today it makes up about 20% of the hard surface flooring market and uh, it's growing exponentially year on year. Um, some of the buildings that I routinely see it used in are schools. Education is kind of low-hanging fruit. Um, you know, they have set and standard maintenance budgets and uh, want lots of decorative patterns usually. Uh, and so this is a great long life floor, very low, uh, very low cost maintenance. So schools and universities are low hanging fruit. You see a lot of today, you see pretty much every stadium in the United States has gone to polished concrete floors because they hold up so much better to traffic. Retail most, I would say probably 95% of all grocery chains in the U.S. have converted over to traffic uh, or to polish. We do a lot of grocery store work. Uh, automotive, car dealerships love polished concrete floors. They do a good job of reflecting the cars and showing off the, the highlight in the showroom, but they don't leave uh, tire marks when they move around vehicles and the floors are easy to clean and take care of. Churches, I see a lot more churches go into polished concrete, mainly because of their low cost um, maintenance budgets. Um, see a lot of office buildings, especially hallways and public spaces, uh, gone to polished concrete. And then the uh, the original use, intended use, industrial. We see lots and lots and lots of manufacturing plants, and you know this is a big car dealership, but uh, you see a lot of industrial use. So something I know everybody is always very uh, very interested in is price comparisons. Um, especially I understand most everybody on this um, on this presentation is an architect so understanding the price is a very important thing so this is a chart that uh, put together gathered from a few different sources but some of it's pretty uh, typical for the industry so nationwide the average cost for VCT is a dollar fifty a foot or a little bit higher um, average maintenance so when I say maintenance here, I'm stating uh, cleaning, waxing, stripping, buffing, everything that goes into maintaining a floor. So VCT floors, you know, the lowest price install floor uh, has the highest maintenance cost at $1.85 per foot per year and the shortest life uh, at average, you know, eight or nine years, 10 years before it needs to be replaced. Ceramic tile, quarry tile, these prices are pretty average from around the country. Terrazzo, $16.50, I think that's a little bit low based on what I've started seeing lately. 
But the interesting thing is that the maintenance on Terrazzo is the same as the maintenance on VCT. You still have to clean it daily, uh, keep it waxed because you got to live on the wax, buff it constantly trying to keep out uh, or get out scuff marks and uh, little scratches and scars, strip the wax and re-wax it periodically, depending on the use, obviously. Um, an office building is going to have a lot less uh, re-waxing than, say, an airport would uh, or a school would. Polished concrete at four bucks a foot. That's an average price. Uh, new construction is a little less than that. I think the national average right now for new construction is about $2.95 a foot. Um, where polished, uh, or, I'm sorry, remodel with um, uh, removing glues and mastics and doing some repairs uh, is averaging about $5.50 a foot, something like that. So $4 is a pretty good average. Interesting thing um, on the comparative cost for polished concrete, the maintenance is at 45 cents a foot. That's the higher maintenance cost. You can tell, uh, we'll go into maintenance in a few minutes, but <clears throat> if you do standard maintenance, it's a little bit less. Uh, this is a, a maintenance set cost that would uh, maintain, the, maintain the polish. Here's your real, very interesting cost comparisons here. Um, your VCT, which was the lowest price install floor over a 20 year life cycle cost is the most expensive uh, floor. Well, Terrazzo is more because of the higher install cost, but VCT is very, very high install cost at 38.50 in a 20 year life cycle. This does not take into account removal and replacement. Um, look at the, if you look at the average uh, years of life in a 20 year time, you would typically have to either cover or replace a VCT floor because they typically don't hold up that long. Replacement of VCT, you have to take off the existing VCT, which is currently about a dollar to a dollar fifty per foot, uh, and then lay a new one down at the original installation cost. Polished concrete, on the other hand, is uh, less than a third the cost of VCT on a 20 year life cycle, obviously because of the maintenance cost. One of the things that, uh, you know, with polished concrete is that it never needs to be replaced. Um, you'll only ever go back onto a polished floor and run approximately the, the half of the, uh, the top half of the process. You'll never need to do the grinding, the metal bonds section again, typically a refurbish of polished concrete floor starts at a 100 grit resin and goes up. The picture you see here, oops, the picture you see here on the right hand side of the photo is um, the refurbished floor, the left hand side of the photo. This was actually a job that, uh, that um, I polished about 15 years ago that is currently being redone. Um, this particular project is in uh, Kentucky in a retail store. And uh, so after 15 years of not doing very good maintenance on the floors. Uh, the floor had lost most of its uh, shine and looked pretty dull and kind of washed out. Contractor comes back in, runs uh, uh, 100, 200, 400, 800, 1500 resins again at a cost of around $1.75 a foot and uh, brings the gloss completely back. So you can. Uh, uh, even if you don't do a very good job maintaining a polished concrete floor, it's pretty easy to refurbish. Unlike a, a tile floor, you never need to remove the tile, so you don't have any downtime. Um, when you're doing refurbishing a polished concrete, typically a crew can do about 3,000 square foot per night uh, and can work around existing fixtures so that uh, things don't need to be moved around. So let's talk a little bit about uh, maintenance for polished concrete. There's two basic types. Um, you have standard maintenance, which is basically sweep the floor daily, spot mop when something spills, uh, auto scrub using a polished concrete cleaner and a white pad. This is a very low cost maintenance. At this, uh, at this level of maintenance, you'll have 
an average gloss loss of about three points per year. Um, to kind of give you a relative term there, if uh, when we finish the polished concrete floor, if you were able to look down, uh, say within three or four feet of your feet, you could see a clear reflection of the ceiling above at a 1500 grit polish. Uh, if you did a standard maintenance process at 10 years, you would be able to see that clear reflection of the ceiling above at about 20 feet away from you. So you got to look out a little bit in front of you and you can still see the clear reflection above. It doesn't change as concrete wears, as polished concrete wears, it gets micro scratches that just uh, break up that reflected light. So it doesn't really change the overall um, texture of the floor, the maintenance process of the floor, the, the overall look of the floor. Um, color is still there, things like that, but uh, the gloss does go down. Your other option for polished concrete maintenance, I call it enhanced, is to use uh, pad systems under your scrubber. So you do the same maintenance as far as you sweep it regularly, spot mop it when something spills, auto scrub it, and using polished concrete cleaner. Uh, but instead of a standard white, uh, soft white scrubbing pad, you'll switch for a diamond impregnated pad, uh, like some of the ones you see here on the on the slide and uh, these pads will essentially take out those micro scratches every day when you scrub the floor so instead of the gloss dropping over time uh, you can maintain that gloss level in perpetuity so the difference in the cost for the standard is about 25 to 30 cents per foot per year and an enhanced system like this is about uh, 45 cents per foot per year um, depending on the, the product you use to traffic, you know, you may go up a little bit from that or down a little bit from that. That's pretty much what I see. That, that would be what we would expect to see at like a school uh, or a grocery store. So I wanted to go through a few of the common mistakes that, um, that happen in the industry. Uh, as, as I said, for those of you who are who joined us a little late, when polished concrete very first started, um, it was fairly controlled. There was relatively few manufacturers. As the industry has exploded, as it uh, um, as it grew extremely fast, there's a lot of guys that get into it, both from a manufacturer standpoint and from a contractor standpoint, that um, that don't have a lot of experience. And so, what happens is, is guys try to find ways to be able to classify that they do polished concrete, but um, in a process by which they can uh, bid for cheap and do without having very much skill. So polished concrete, uh, a lot like terrazzo or stone is a, is a trade craftsman process. So some things that I see across the country run into regularly, uh, abbreviated or reduced steps polishing. So in this kind of instance, guys will, um, and there's some manufacturers out there that will sell a three-step or a four-step polish. It's mainly um, using the use of uh, chemicals to get the polish. So instead of doing a mechanical process where you, like sandpaper, you started an aggressive grit, you work through the, the paste layer of the concrete, you mechanically hone the, the slab and get it flat, smooth, and then start working out your scratches uh, and moving up higher in grits until you get to a, a finish that reflects light mechanically without uh, any chemical assistance. Guys will substitute and do chemical treatments and essentially put on, for lack of a better term, more like waxes into the, or hard, hard waxes onto the surface and call it polished concrete. So abbreviated or reduced step polishing using chemicals is something that I run into frequently. Um, guys will bid it at $2 a foot or $1.75 a foot and, uh, uh, and try to sell that as polished concrete. The downside of this type of system or, or these things, um, also the, the third one here, bad, 
grinding guys that don't really have a lot of experience or knowledge running the equipment uh, leave scratches in the finish and then we'll put a, a topical sealer or a you know heavy stain protection product over the top to hide their scratches that they leave in the finish the problem with these um, uh, reduced polishing processes uh, is that they wear really fast uh, i'll tell you about a, a target store uh, that we went in and fixed not too long ago where it had been polished and within um, less than 30 days the gloss had gone down about 50 percent and uh, what happened is is the floor had bad scratches and a topical sealer was put over the surface of it and everywhere that you had uh, traffic patterns walk people walking down the main aisleways they walk through the uh the chemical on the surface and it exposes a, a low gloss mechanical polish so a typical polished concrete finish a good polished concrete finish when you're trying to run specifications um is about seven steps so you'll see these abbreviated step processes running three steps or four steps and then using chemicals to try to make up the difference uh, i wouldn't recommend um, taking those uh, bids taking those proposals because they're you're doing your customer a disservice because they don't last very long you know sometimes a month sometimes two months but uh, very quickly probably about as soon as somebody gets paid you'll start to lose your shine now understanding that you're uh, architects I wanted to go through some keys to writing better specifications so polished concrete can only be as good as the concrete placement uh, place and finishing of the base slab so if you have a bad slab, bad pour, uh, you know, it's really hard to get a really good polished concrete finish on that surface. For flatness, floor flatness, floor levelness, um, I recommend a floor flatness of 50. Uh, it's not as hard to get that as some people would claim using a, uh, a laser screed with uh, uh, a ride-on power trial can almost every project hit you a 50. Uh, I look at concrete on about uh, 300 projects a year, myself personally, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more, depending on how close the projects are and how quickly I can get around to them. But uh, look at a lot of projects. And I would say probably 85% of the new construction projects um, were able to just with a pre-pour conference Help them get to a floor flatness of 50. If you get below a floor flatness of 35, uh, it becomes pretty hard to polish and get a consistent finish. What will happen there is you'll get a lot of a lot of humps and valleys, you know, and um, kind of like a lawnmower going over an anthill, the grinders will cut off the high spots and ride over the low spots. So you'll end up with pockets of larger aggregate and pockets of no aggregate uh, throughout the slab if you get below a 35. Anything uh, above a 35 can be pretty decent and if it's a 50 or better it's usually really good finish. Protection during construction. This is an important piece. Um, I see some jobs and some contractors where they you know they'll uh, get protection to cover the whole job. I don't usually recommend that just because of the high cost uh, to do that. So what I recommend is that no matter what, no matter what uh, what the contractors say, every lift that comes on a job needs to have a diaper on it. This will stop hydraulic oil leaks and battery acid leaks from hitting the concrete. Uh, both of those are kind of hard for us to deal with. The other thing that uh, causes a big problem is screws in the lift in, in the lift tires. When you run a uh, a 2,000 pound lift over the head of a screw, you know, it comes out to about 12 or 13,000 psi. Well, we don't normally pour concrete that strong, so that leaves a lot of chips in the surface. And a lot of times those chips are a little deeper than what a typical grind will take out, so you end up left, you end up being left with a lot of damage in the slab. So screws and lift tires. If uh, if I can get them to do protection, like an actual protection mat. 
Uh, I usually ask them to do it the first 50 feet inside the entrances because that takes the abuse from uh, dirt and rocks coming from out of the building and also the uh, everything coming in on the stored materials before it's spread because you have uh, concentrated traffic in those entrances. Contractor job qualifications. This is a huge deal. So any good contractor worth their salt will have uh, manufacturer certifications from Ardex or, or other manufacturers of products they use like their machinery and their repair materials and their chemical treatments. They'll all have training from those manufacturers. The, uh, I apologize. I'm, I skipped one there. Contractor job qualification. So if you're doing a 100,000 square foot school and your contractor, I actually had this happen to me. I do some consulting work as well. And I had this happen to me recently. Um, we had a 200,000 square foot project and I asked for the contractor job qualifications and the contractor gave me a, a gas station, two houses uh, and a motorcycle repair shop. So nothing bigger than about 5,000 square feet, but they're going to try to do a 2,000 square foot job or 200,000 square foot job. So check your contractor job qualifications to make sure that they do it, that they know how to do work and they've done work of similar size and scope to the project you're doing. Manufacturer certifications is where I was a second ago. So every manufacturer gives classes on how to install their products. If you don't go through their classes, you can't get warranty and um, a lot of times, you know, the guys have no idea how to install those products. So <clears throat> manufacturer certifications are something you want to ask for every time, not just for the company, um, but also for the foreman or in shift leader uh, of everybody on the project. So if you have three crews running on your big job, then each foreman and shift leader needs to have manufacturer certifications. It doesn't work when Two guys went through a training class in 2015 from a manufacturer and haven't been certified since, and not a single person on your project has ever been trained how to install that uh, that material. It's hard to get warranty and hard to know that you're actually getting um, correct installations. And then ask for warranty requirements. Um, depending on what you're doing, Every manufacturer's got some version of warranties that they offer for their products. Uh, if you make sure that you that your contractor qualifies for those warranties, i.e. manufacturer certifications and that they know how to do the work, they have contractor job qualifications, uh, then you can you can get the warranties for your projects. So here's where I, I wanted to put some time in to say, guys, ask the questions you have because uh, we're getting closer to the end of the uh, the slideshow, the, the PowerPoint, and uh, I wanna be able to answer questions when we finish. So, polished concrete, as I said in the beginning, is growing very fast. Um, it's gone from about 8% of the hard surface flooring market to 20% of the hard surface, floor, surface flooring market in five years. Um, because of the maintenance, because of the durability, because of the overall appearance, because of the the lead in green building, from because of the efficiency of the space, polished concrete being a thermal mass slows down. Um, you know, it cools well and holds on to cool air better. It holds on to heat better and, and cools down slowly. So it's very energy efficient. The light reflectivity allows you to cut down the light in the space. I remember. When we first started polishing Walmart stores, uh, the first couple of stores that we polished, they had to come through and turn off every other bay of lights because the light reflectivity on a VCT floor is a lot less than the light reflectivity on a polished concrete floor. For all these reasons, polished concrete is growing very fast. Um, I put in here 300% increase in polished concrete use in the last five years. That's probably a little bit underestimating that. Uh, talking to all the manufacturers, all the distributors at Orla Concrete, we get a, a number of about 27,000 companies that register that say they do polished concrete work in the United States. But when you go to every manufacturer together and you look at all the contractors combined, 
that have actually gone through training classes, you see that there's about 6,000 certified applicators uh, in the United States. So, you know, less than 20% of the guys that, uh, that say they do polished concrete have actually ever been trained. So choose your contractor well. That's my best piece of advice to, uh, to everybody on this presentation. That ends our, uh, our PowerPoint. Um, I would love to take whatever questions you guys have. Um, please, Melissa, if you can read some. Yeah, absolutely. So I have quite a few good ones and we have a lot of time. So I will um, read as many as we can. Um, how long did the grinding pucks that you mentioned last? So the metal, obviously it's a little bit different for every slab. Um, the tighter the finish uh, on the concrete, the longer the tooling will last. A lot like, uh, a lot like stone, if I put a, a grinding pad on a granite, uh, once I get the first cut, those pads, every other pad after that will last a long time. If I use the exact same tool on, say, marble, because it's soft and porous, uh, the increased heat and increased fr friction will cause them to wear away faster. Metal bond tooling typically lasts around 7,000 to 10,000 square feet uh, per set. Uh, I think it's important to note that those big machines typically take anywhere from uh, nine to 27 sets of diamonds per, and eat, or diamond segments per, and uh, each diamond segment um, costs anywhere from, uh, I got one sitting here on my desk, I could show you guys. So this is a uh, is a resin tool. These typically last 15 to 20,000 square feet per uh, puck set. Just like with uh, with diamonds in your wedding ring, the lower the grit and the larger the diamond particulate, the more expensive the tooling is. So the metal bond steps are typically anywhere from six to ten dollars per uh, per individual segment. So you may end up with uh, 200 segments on a machine uh, and the metal bonds, the, the finer grits, those are anywhere from um, four to six bucks uh, a piece. And you usually have a lot, a lot, a lot less of those because you have a lot less of that grinding that needs to happen by the time you're in the polishing phases. So 10,000, 7,000 feet on the low end for the metal bond grinding stock removal steps and 15 to 20,000 feet on the high steps and each manufacturer varies a little bit as well cool um if a metal inlay is used in polished concrete how does that affect the polishing process if a metal inlay so <laughs> that's a great question um remember that there's a diamonds that are cutting the concrete so diamonds really don't care i don't care if there's metal uh probably one of the most common things you'll see is guys Concrete placement guys don't knock down their grade stakes or their rebar sticks up and you'll see the big grinders will go right across it and grind it and it'll be smooth and shiny and polished forever. If you do a metal inlay, which I've done that a lot, um, you can polish no problem. I've In my time, I've polished a lot of very interesting things. I've done uh, uh, hammerheads and saw bits, saw, you know, big, big saw bits. Um, I've done, I've polished keys. Um, I polished metal shavings, all kinds of rock, glass, aggregates. You can put all that in the slab. Uh, I polished microchips once for a, for a big computer manufacturer. Um, pretty much the diamonds will polish anything you want in the slab. They'll, I remember uh, uh, there's a third grade classroom in a school in Arkansas that uh, has a perfect skull can skull chewing tobacco can lid sitting face up flush in the concrete because the finisher threw it on the ground stepped on it into the wet mud and troweled over it and uh when we polished it it was just at the perfect level that it polished it up beautifully and the school said i'd rather have that than a big hole with a different colored concrete so uh, it doesn't really matter what you want to put in the slab you can you can polish whatever it is that you want gotcha um Another question, how does the sheen level impact dynamic coefficient of friction? And then is there a way to test for slip resistance? 
Sure. There's actually there's two. Those are two questions. So those are both great questions. Um, the highest level of polish has virtually the same dynamic coefficient of friction that a say a matte finish or a satin finish floor would. So if you stopped at a 400 grit uh, resin and you had a, a low gloss finish, or if you went to a 1500 grit resin and had a high gloss finish, your dynamic co coefficient of friction is the same. Uh, I'm going to use, I'm going to go back a little bit in my slideshow presentation here and show you guys one slide that will easily demonstrate that or explain what I'm talking about. So if you see this, this slab here, the, the picture on top is, uh, you know, a representation of a microscopic view of a power trial, power trial finish slab. After grinding the picture on the bottom, you see one of the things that you'll see, you see all those little valleys that are still left. We grind off a lot of the peaks and create plateaus that do a great job of reflecting light, but the valleys are still there. Well, if you imagine the uh, uh, round ball of liquid, say, say water or whatever, sitting on the surface, you can't really hydroplane or have a, a slip and fall on a polished concrete floor because the that instead of rolling along the surface, the balls fall into the valleys and it breaks the plane, allowing your, your feet to come into contact with a polished concrete surface and uh, you'll almost stick. So you typically on a polished concrete floor, you'll slide a half an inch to three quarters of an inch and then almost stick to the to the surface. Now, obviously, it's important to keep the, the concrete clean because if you have, a say, a buildup of grease or something like that, then that's going to fill in a lot of those uh, those valleys, those microscopic valleys and allow that. The second part of the question um, was, is there a way to test? Yes, there is. Um, there machines i have one called a bot 3000 uh it's called the type of machine is called a tribometer and uh it's very easy to test for coefficient of friction um and slip resistance i'll tell you that probably the the highest gloss polished concrete finish um with a topical stain protect everything is still significantly safe 40 to 50% uh, better slip resistance than a tile floor would be. So polished concrete in every variety meets all of your uh, OSHA and ADA compliance for uh, slip resistance. Great. Um, what would be your top reason to go with a topping instead of polishing the existing slab? Um, that's a great question. So we do a lot of toppings. Um, our favorite, which is one of the reasons why I'm talking to you guys through Ardex, is uh, Ardex K521 uh, is my favorite product. It has a, a small aggregate in it and has great uh, impact resistance and uh, polishes really well and holds up to traffic really well. We use overlays most often to repair regular concrete, uh, to repair regular concrete that is uh, is damaged in some way or another. So maybe the maybe the finish the trial wasn't good. Maybe it's got tons of air in it. Um, you know, maybe it delaminated. Maybe uh, you know it got uh, damaged through prior construction we do a lot of trenches you know when you're cutting back for uh for plumbing um, or electrical we usually will have the the contractor the general contractor fill the the trench up to about a half an inch below the surface then we'll use a, a topping across the the top half inch um, and we do that for a couple reasons number one it's very hard to get a tight finish on the top half inch of uh on the top half inch of a hand troweled pour back slab um, and so a, an overlay is a much uh, tighter denser surface uh, also from a time standpoint when you're pouring new concrete back in trenches and pour backs and things like that 
you would need to let the concrete cure fully before you can put a gloss back on it. I can grind it early. I, I grind a lot at seven days or 10 days after concrete is placed but I can't put a polish on it that early because I got to wait and let the moisture get out of the slab. So if I pour concrete in a trench and leave it half an inch low, I can wait two days and then put a topping down over in the top half inch and polish it. And by day three, I've handed it back over to the owner uh, ready to use. I'll also, a lot of times, uh, you see this a lot in like malls and multi-generational spaces where prior remodels will come in and they'll go to take up tile with chipping hammers or something like that. And you've got, you know, it looks like the moon craters on the moon trying to get uh, the surface flat. So we'll put an overlay topping over slabs like that to just give a new, a new foundation to polish and start with. Great. Um, there was a question that uh, came about clarifying one of the slides, um, you mentioned man uh, manufacturer certifications. They wanted to know the manufacturer of what? The grinding equipment or the densifiers? Yeah, so the, the, the four that are main to, um, to go after, number one, the grinding equipment manufacturer. Uh, number two, the grinding equipment manufacturer, for the most part, will be a tooling manufacturer as well. Uh, number two would be any uh, chemical treatments. Um, three, I'm sorry, three. The other one was uh, project certification or you know prior projects. But so your joint fill and repair material manufacturer, uh, including that would be including Ardex, any any repair materials that are used, the machinery and the chemicals. Uh, those are the those are the manufacturers that you want to have certifications on for for. Every foreman, crew lead, shift leader, everybody on the project needs to have been trained by the manufacturers for those. And that's something that's very common, you know, with good contractors. Um, manufacturers do a great job of coming out to projects or coming to uh, coming to our shops and doing training or offering training classes that we go to regularly. So, um, you know, pretty much every every good contractor will have a lot of guys that have been through manufacturer training. Absolutely. And Ardex, just a sidebar, Ardex does offer training for our polished uh, toppings, polished concrete products um, throughout the year. And a lot of our sales rep representatives throughout the country can also come on location and train crews as well. So if you have questions about that, feel free to reach out to me um, after the presentation and I can give you more information on that. Um, have you seen the use of curing additives causing problems during the polishing process? Absolutely, that's a fantastic question. So probably 20% uh, of what I do every day is managing concrete pours. Uh, I get involved pretty heavily in pre-pour meetings. Uh, I review mixed designs pretty consistently. And so the things that I look for in mixed designs when I'm reviewing them, number one, I look for the recycled material content. So uh, whether it's fly ash or blast slag, it needs to be under 20%. Uh, the reason why is if you hit 20% recycled material content, then you avoid all warranties and your densifier hardeners won't work um, at all. They have to have so much um, leftover calcium hydroxide, which is a byproduct of the concrete, the cement getting hard, so if you um, replace enough of that cement, you don't have enough reactive material for your chemical treatments for your polished concrete finish. Um, today, uh, admixture companies, you know, they love to sell juice, all different kinds of chemical tr chemical products. So when we're doing a polished concrete finish, uh, I typically say I don't allow a uh, high range water reducer, high dosages. I'll, I'll allow a mid range uh, with mid range dosages uh, or a high range with mid range dosages, if that's what they wanna use. Uh, we try to keep the water cement ratio somewhere around 0.5, um, much less than that. And the mixes get more like peanut butter. They're hard to, hard to get flat, good finishes. And much above, if you hit 6.6, .6, uh, then you'll start to have aggregate fall out of suspension and 
you know, start to have cement paste issues at the top. So uh, I look for that. The one, uh, I'll share a very specific one with you guys that we have problems with all the time that I try to hit, get out of every project. It's um, uh, a water reducer called Plastocrete. Uh, and that has some kind of polymer in it that floats to the surface. And when, uh, when that material is used in the, in the mix, I have a very hard time getting color in or getting chemical reactions to occur. But most other admixtures, um, we don't try to keep the dosages as low as realistically possible, uh, but we can, we can handle most of them. Uh, curing compounds are a huge issue for us. When you have um, uh, a standard cure and seal, we have to come through and remove the sealer component before we can polish the finish. If you use a dissipating cure, if it's a standard UV-based dissipating cure, um, then unfortunately the construction schedules today, everybody wants to put walls and a roof up as fast as they can, and those products need 30 days of good sunny days before the component will break down. So when we get on those, it's I might as well just be trying to deal with a cure and seal because it's I've got to cut through it and grind through it to get uh, to get into the concrete. Personally, I like to uh, to use um, a new class of cure, either a water cure, seven day water cure, uh, or more commonly today we use or recommend uh, the new class of cure, which is uh, penetrating, film forming, dissipating cures that dissipate with oxygen. Um, that's my, my kind of favorite. Uh, we have sometimes issues with water cures with guys, windy days, blowing up blankets. And, uh, I got a job that I'm looking at right now that it looks like a football field because there's lines every three feet from hydration from the, from the blankets. But, uh, so keeping guys off the slab for seven days and keeping the, the, uh, water, uh, keeping the slab watered, if they'll do it, that's a great cure for us for any type of decorative slab, uh, whether it's a sealed surface or a polished surface. But a, a dissipating cure that we can get to actually dissipate is a is a huge benefit to us. I know that's a little more info than the question asked for, but figured you no, guys can all uh, benefit from that. We like the in-depth answers here. That's what I we're do. here for. <laughs> the more um, information I can give you guys, the better. Exactly. Um, any recommendations on polishing slab on grade to avoid cracking? Is a separate topping slab better? Are there any reinforcing requirements? No, the, the best thing that I can tell you uh, for polishing a slab on grade is don't be scared of control joints. We can, uh, we pick the control of uh, the uh, joint fill material. Uh, we'll pick it to be a very close match to the concrete color after we polish it so that, uh, that the joints blend in with the overall appearance. I don't know, some architects, they want them to stand out as a, as a design piece, but most, most everybody wants them to blend in. Going from 15 foot on center to 10 foot on center doesn't cost much money, but it will reduce a significant amount of cracking. As far as cracking goes, I'll give another little side. Pretty much if, it's, uh, if a crack is wide enough for us to put a, a credit card in, then we'll fill it just as it is. Unless it's an industrial job, I don't like to chase them because it causes them to stand out a whole lot more. Um, most of those cracks are gonna be curing cracks, which uh, if we fill them with a micro injection needle with joint fill material, they'll never open back up. But if it's too thin to put a, um, to put a, a credit card in or a business card in, then I would recommend, and it's a curing crack, I would recommend you just leaving it alone because after a week of that crack being cleaned, uh, just regular use, it'll visually disappear, and it's too small to cause a, a long-term wear problem or a, a maintenance issue or a safety issue. Uh, it would only be a safety issue if it was a if it was a, a settling crack or a, a structural crack. And if you got that, then you got something else to worry about beyond the polishing. We could always chase those and fill them uh, if the space if the slab is stabilized, but for thin cracks, I recommend just leave them alone, get them cleaned. The uh, if you want to see what it would look like after it's clean, just get it, get the, wipe the crack a little bit with some water, and you'll see that it visually will blend with the 
surrounding area and won't stand out at all. Um, what specifically are the differences between polishing on new concrete versus old concrete? Um, as far as the the actual concrete itself, not really anything. I mean, I've polished uh, concrete. I think the oldest was like 106 years old that we polished, and it was beautiful. The um, uh, as far as the process goes, we use the exact same machines. We use the exact same tooling. Everything usually on a remodel project will go down one more step. So if a new construction project starts in 80 grit metal, is the typical new construction starting point that gets you a, a fine sand aggregate or looks like salt and pepper very monolithic and pretty consistent and clear across the the building on a remodel slab we'll typically go down one step and start at a 40 grit metal um, because a lot of times we're trying to take off glue or mastic or you know leveling compound or something so we usually end up going down one more step. Remodels, uh, old slabs, especially they've been through multiple remodels, tend to have, you know, holes from prior walls or trenches or other damage. And so um, we'll use uh, other repair materials. Sometimes we'll use grout coat to fill in little pits and holes, especially depending on the age of the slab. It may have uh, not been poured with very good quality control, so it may have more air voids in it than a than a newer slab does, but uh, we'll just use more repair materials that blend and match with the concrete and, uh, and the same mechanical processes. Great, um, we can take a couple more. Um, if a polished concrete slab is installed, oh, I'm sorry, that's not the one I wanted to read, but I will read that one next. Um, how can you get the same quality polish around edges of walls or other obstructions like inside corners where the larger equipment cannot reach? So uh, that's a great question too. The Typically you do, okay, if it's a new construction building, we try to come on and polish the, do the first grind, the first cuts at about seven days after the concrete is poured. Uh, that allows us to grind with the big machines before the walls go up. Uh, it's very easy to hand polish a slab. It's hard to hand grind a slab when you have a 150 pound guy on a four inch hand grinder trying to match a 2000 pound grinder uh, in depth. That's difficult. It's easy to bring up the shine and hard to, to get the grind. If um, um, we do have walls to go around, which is still pretty uh, pretty common, uh, usually the specifications that, that I try to work on and, and talk about is getting within one half of an inch of the vertical. So a standard cove base is a quarter inch thick with another quarter inch toe kick. So pretty much every good contractor worth their salt can get easily polished the, uh, the edges up to within one half an inch. Um, as far as new construction, the probably the biggest uh, struggle that we face is on um, uh, slabs that uh, have poor hand finished edges. I can show you guys something here. Um, let me go here. I've actually got it already pulled up for you. So here is bad edge finishing. So this, um, Alyssa, can everybody see this picture that I'm showing here? Um, right now, all I see is a blue screen. Okay, let me do this sharing thing again. Can you tell me when you can see it? We can see it. Okay, so everything that you see in white here, this lighter colored finish, is actually hand trowels. So that's the guy hand troweling around the perimeter of the slab. So when I'm dealing with a pre-construction, pre-pour meeting, uh, I tell the finishers that I want them to go along the edge of every, of every concrete pour with a walk behind trowel, going either onto the form or over onto the adjacent slabs, uh, whichever, if there's a little bit of scratching, we can take that out with the grinders without a problem. But if you have uh, hand finish marks, unfortunately, the, 
the very top skin may look fine to them when they're troweling it, but as soon as we grind it, we open it up and it's pitted and porous and, and it's like uh, the difference, the, the middle of the slab is like granite, the edge is like pumice rock. Uh, so it's very hard for us to polish, very hard for us to polish pumice rock. So what you end up with is even though you can see that I've got a shine across this, you can see the light reflection right there in front of the door, I've got a shine across this floor, but it stands out and looks horrible because the the finished texture of the concrete itself. So running a, a walk behind trowel around the perimeter of your uh, pores will take care of this and get the finish consistent all the way across the edge. We can get the polish. It's the concrete finish that a lot of times gives us trouble. Gotcha. Um, we'll take two more questions here. Um, are there limits for moisture in the slab and does that cause problems uh, before, after, and dur during the polishing process? So polished concrete is a breathable finish. Um, that's one of the reasons it's it's very durable on on really bad moisture slabs. Some retailers will uh, will do moisture testing and actually select their polished slabs based on the ones that have high moisture content. Um, polished concrete is breathable, so it allows the moisture to evaporate through. The only problems that we occasionally see is when uh, there's a lot of salt in the concrete, especially along the coasts, where you end up with a lot of salt in the sand that they use to make the concrete. The moisture will evaporate the salt, carry it to the surface, and leave it. If the floor is not cleaned, um, not cleaned consistently, then that salt will leave a white film residue on the surface. Um, and last one, um, what is your view of sealers versus guard type products? So uh, a lot of it depends on your maintenance. If you're using a maintenance that, um, uh, that you want to use one of the pad systems, somebody earlier asked about polishing metal. Can you, uh, can you see this, Alyssa? We can, yes. Yeah, so this is a piece of rebar that was sitting flush on the flat or flush on the surface of the concrete when we ground it and you can see that the machines just polish it up um so you're asking about maintenance so the um, um the stain protect or topical product that you use if you're using one of the pad systems that maintains the polish those topical stain protects only last a couple of weeks and the pad system will strip them right off the floor. So for most of our projects, uh, we prefer the penetrating stain protect products. Um, the When it's a penetrating, then I don't have a surface wear. It shows my mechanical polish better. That's the wear surface the customer will have for life. Uh, and I can give them a, a maintenance system that holds that gloss level that stops them from having to do refurbishing uh, down the line and they still maintain their stain protection for years. If they use a topical product, even if, even if you're using a standard maintenance with a white scrubbing pad, uh, a topical product will need to be replaced every year or two at the most, where a penetrating product will last five years or more. So I prefer the penetrating products rather than a, a topical stain protect type products. Awesome. Well. Um that is, I think, the end of all the Q&A we have here. Um, there were a few other questions that um, we can discuss offline. Um, but David, do you have anything else that you want to add? Any other photos you want to show? Oh, I've got lots of photos. Because <laughs> I was looking at some of them when you were scrolling through. Yeah, this is, this is a file that's actually called Architectural Info Folders. The, uh, let's see here. Here's another bad finishing, a bad edge finishing on a um, on a colored slab. See the the hand finished uh, line right here. It was so bad here that we we put a four inch border around this entire school to try to help because this is actually not the worst area of the project. That's an old project. Um, here's another bad bad edges. It's pretty pretty rough, right? The uh, you can see another. This is another one where you see the the hand trial finish around columns. So that's a that's an important one. 
Uh, here you got a joint running right along a control joint or a construction joint where they missed on the block wall set and you see the uh, the epoxy joint running right along the edge. Uh, here's a round column block out. I like those versus a diamond column block out with uh, with not great edge finishing. A lot of times your block outs will come out and they'll do a different color entirely. <laughs> So it looks not very attractive because the, they'll use a different mix from a different company uh, or cheaper product or easier to get on site. You got some, here's some different ones of that same knit. When you're trying to do a lot of removal, this is a uh, this is a scarifier blade for a grinder. So this will take off heavy underlayments or you know topping slabs or uh, you know like. Uh, some inches epoxy, things like that. Here's screw chips going down a hallway after polishing. So screws on a lift tire. It's probably the, the electrician. He's usually the culprit here along the walls. Another job, same same issue. I don't remember what this one was. Oh, it was a clean out that they uh, they forgot to. They troweled the concrete over it and then never came back through and opened it back up. There's bad cleanouts where they come through and ship the concrete really bad, and we have to kind of try to come in and fix those. Uh, here's a cold joint in the middle of a in the middle of a grocery store with two different pours from two different uh, suppliers. I've got I've got tons of photos I can show. Uh, for all different, this is a slab where we uh, broadcast glass aggregate into the concrete, and uh, the actually the con the uh, ready mix the concrete placement contractor broadcast it, and then you can see I got a holiday here at the uh, at the cold pour. So, but if uh, if anybody wants to reach out to me separately, I'm always happy to to help anything I can do to help the industry and, and help projects. I'm happy to, to do that. I'd love to, to share my knowledge. Got a lot of it and I'd love to, love to share it. Thank you once again, David, for allowing us to pick your brain for a little while and for sharing your time as well. And uh, thank you to everyone for joining us today. I hope we will, uh, you'll join us again soon. Thank you. Have a